everyone. I hope you missed us, um, but we were with you the whole time because we're always with you, like Jesus or Santa. Omnipresent. Even when you don't want us to be. Too bad, so sad. Trigger warning, we do have another man in the studio with us today. Second man on the podcast. So for the two men that listen to this shit, you are getting you representation. You're welcome. This literally is a DEI session right now. Look at us. I'm Fraz. I'm Miss Redacted, and our guest, Mr. Rat. Welcome. <laughs> Hey y'all, super excited to be here. We need everybody to come on with a freaking pseudonym from now on. I need everybody to have a snappy name. And we get to pick it for you. (laughs) So welcome, Mr. Rat. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Who are you? How'd you get here? My name is Mr. Rat. Like I was so wonderfully introduced. This name was chosen for me. We do have Rodent Girl 69 on the call with us right now. Hey, Rodent Girl. Listen. (laughs) Rodent Girl was her AIM name. No, my Neopets name. Oh, her Neopets name. Anyways, your career. King, tell tell us about your career. I started off teaching in South Florida just a few years ago. I was an elementary school teacher, so I taught second grade and fourth grade. Enjoyed some parts of it, other parts not so enjoyable. Mm-hmm. I left after two years and now I do training and development for novice teachers. We love. Well, how many kids did you have in your class? My first year I had around 20 in both of my classes. I was departmentalized so I was doing math science. My second year I taught mostly virtually. I had 33. That is a lot. That was fourth grade? Yes that was fourth grade. They are so tall. It really intimidates me going in a place where the kids can see me at eye level. How tall are you, Fraz? I'm five two and a half. I'm taller than redacted. Yeah, I'm five one and a half. Okay. So they yeah, so they were probably about as tall as you. Yeah, it's horrifying. It's very humbling to yell up. What was your rose and thorn of teaching elementary school? Your favorite thing and your least favorite thing? Not a rose and thorn. <laughs> I would say the rose was definitely the student interactions. I think at the end of the day, like I am someone that loves kids, especially my fourth graders. Like I feel like fourth grade is like the perfect age because they're just young enough to where they'll still listen to what you say to them but they're just old enough to where you can like be sarcastic with them you can joke with them and they'll understand it and like just seeing their growth over time like fourth grade is just such a huge like transition period for kids and so seeing them go from like being super shy to like actually opening up and like doing really well in school was definitely the best part the thorn is just like all of the extra stuff that comes with teaching that we have to do that doesn't always serve kids with teaching like you almost need like a whole nother person to help you like take attendance grade y'all know the listeners know all of those extra things made teaching not enjoyable i used to always say i would literally look around and i was like we just need an intern like i just need someone who can just like do some of this shit i don't even care which task you do just anything yeah like can we pull somebody off the street and like pay them to help us grade papers or something. Having an IA was the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, obviously then you get more individualized instruction and it's easier to differentiate if you have somebody that you can be like, can you pull a small group for me? That is so important, but also just taking the busy work out of it because so much of what we do really is not really focused on teaching at all, which is what we got into it for. Absolutely. I'm curious, like, did you have a different experience grade level wise? Oh, totally. First of all, that's a huge gap when we're talking about about child development. A second grader is about eight and a fourth grader is 10 or 11. During those two years, like so much happens for kids developmentally. On that side, like they're totally different. And I think that's why I enjoyed fourth grade so much more. From like a testing and like academic standpoint, like the stakes are just a lot higher in fourth grade. In South Florida and in the district where I taught, starting in third grade, they really start to test kids heavily. So you have that additional pressure and you also have that additional pressure from your administration. Yeah, it's brutal. It's the hardest part for me about third grade. When you're state testing, you have to start using that terminology from like the beginning of the school year. Like, I don't know about you guys, but for us, it was always like calling a story text or like, what is a prompt? What does it mean to cite evidence? Like these huge academic vocabulary words. And we had a lot of English learners Learners. We don't say that anymore. What do we say? Emergent bilingual students at my school. And like, it's freaking tough. Second grade feels more free. 
<laughs> second grade they I feel like third grade is like the like the Thunderdome of elementary school testing like third grade reading testing is like the fucking hunger games of mm-hmm. testing and I also feel like we both taught in Florida and Florida's requirements for one to enter the classroom one is not equipped with as much as I feel one could be equipped so I'm curious like what your experience was with that with going into s- both second being big testing because it's like third is coming up and then fourth kind of being big testing because it's like we just got these scores what are we going to do with them my training was not incredibly long it was about five weeks i feel like it was a start to the preparation that i needed but didn't give me everything that i needed to learn i think the real experience comes from just actually being in the classroom and just diving in head first and i think a lot of the teachers that i support now would tell you the same so you were in the classroom for two years and now you mentor novice teachers so you were a novice teacher now mentoring novice teachers like how has that been i really enjoy it i went through the program myself and now i get to share my experience um, with others i mean as a teacher you're a project planner, you're a counselor, your mom, you're doing so many different things. Part of what I do is cultivate some of the skills in my new teachers to be able to handle those things. But I, I, I really enjoy what I do now. I get to pee whenever I want. I have a flexible work schedule. I feel like I still get to have those moments with kids in the classroom because I'm in, I'm in schools very frequently. But you know, I, I don't have to hold my pee anymore. So we love not getting a UTI. You'd be shocked how many people come on and say that. Like, I think yes. you are, like, the fifth person that's been, like, I can go to the bathroom at any moment. It's a luxury. <laughs> it really it makes a difference. <laughs> just having the ability to be a human being is, the bar is in hell, but here we are. I know that people listening are going to, like, have this thought. Everybody always says about our podcast, Redacted and I are, like, baby teachers, basically. I mean, we taught for, like, yes. four or five years, and we're, now we're on a podcast talking about the problems of the education system, and a lot of people will discredit us and say they weren't in there that long. I don't want to listen to some some new teachers who couldn't hack it in education talk about it. And I remember Redacted you talking about your school and how Mm -hmm. there was this huge disparity where it was like really, really new teachers and really veteran teachers. Mm -hmm. And I saw that at my previous school as well. There are tons of people getting into the field, staying for a very short time and then bouncing. How do you feel about it? How do you think that we explain that? What were like your pain points that you're seeing other people also be like, "Mm, I'm in pain. I feel like that is the question. I think part of it is generational. This new wave of teachers and this new wave of professionals, like we're just willing to put up with less. I remember being at my school and turning to veteran teachers when decisions were being made and being like, what's going on? Like we have to do something about this. Like, why is this happening? And them just being like, oh, that's just how it is. You'll get over it. Mm -hmm. I just remember going home and being like, this is not going to be for me in the long term. You're like, when do I get over it? Right. Because like right now I'm kind of upset. Because I'm not and I'm so mad about it. I also think that there's just like so many more opportunities now, like post COVID, now that we're moving towards a lot more remote work that can make you the same amount, if not significantly more than teaching. It's sad because I'm seeing a lot of teachers that came in at the same time as me who are great teachers, had some of the best student data at their school like I did, and didn't want to stay because of the pay. If you can make more being a bartender or driving for Uber Eats, why are you going to subject yourself to all of this pressure from, you know, your admin, parents coming at you, all of the responsibilities of teaching? Like, why are you going to do that to yourself when you can pee whatever you want and make more money? I have had the best conversations with veteran teachers, and I've learned so much from them. There's been times they, like, carried me on their back because of the conversations where they're like this is just how it is is how it's always been and they'll tell me about the recession or about when common core rolled out and how that was all falling on them and they had no training you know they're talking about these very pivotal moments in education and I really value that experience but when I got into teaching I was thinking oh well I need to stay for this many years and then I'll get my pension and then I'll leave teachers who are significantly closer to receiving a really great pension when they retire are less likely 
likely to leave. Friends that I had that were veteran teachers who were like, I am five years away from retiring. I'm not going to leave. Like they can do anything to me. And the way they survive and get through it is saying this is just what it is. I think that like you hit the nail on the head with saying like a lot of the veteran teachers will say this is just how it is. I always feel bad when I see veteran teachers be like, stop hating on us because like I'm being a hater out of love. Like I feel like I'm looking at veteran teachers the way you would look at a friend in an abusive relationship where it's like literally why are you just being like, okay, King, sounds absolutely perfect. Like I'm in this meeting with you. I'm looking at this. This is absolutely batshit crazy. And you're telling me to just like soldier on and get over it. Like, are you okay? Like I sometimes just want to shake people and be like, are you okay? Because I think they've shown in Abbott Elementary kind of the only way to get through it is to numb yourself a little bit and to like cut yourself off emotionally and set that boundary within your own mind to be able to be in that environment where people are making decisions that are outside of your control that affect everything you do that you know are bad decisions. Yeah, absolutely. When I was in my education program, I was really instilled with a lot of passion. I was interested in like advocacy and making change in the system. And I was told that I could make change in student teaching and you might see some things going on that you don't agree with. Everybody's advice will be like, well, when you're in the classroom, you're gonna call the shots and you don't have to do that if you don't want to. But oftentimes, you end up in a school as the full-time teacher and you're like shit I have like you said all this extra stuff to do and I'm drowning and you see the bureaucracy and the politics of it all it's just tough if you don't get into like the perfect school which of course doesn't exist is the perfect school in the room with us now at least there's like less so (laughs) abusive schools there's schools where your abuse is gate kept by your admin there's really good admin out there but they're you know they're drowning too is that something you've noticed with any of the teachers that you've mentored, I don't want to like make you bust out names, but what are some things that you think have made it more realistic and doable for some novice teachers to like get their footing? I have seen a drastic difference. I support 14 different schools and I also meet with my teacher's administration. Good leadership really has an effect on teachers being willing to stay and just the culture of the school overall. I have seen poor leadership turn schools completely in the wrong direction and half of the teachers leave after a year. I've also seen the opposite. I've seen good leadership bring teachers together. Good leadership is really there for the right reasons. They don't care about power. They care about the kids. I do believe that everybody starts out caring about kids, but I think that after being in a broken system for so long, the politics and the power games get to you. I've even seen that in my short time working with administrators. I've seen them start to change over time because they have so much pressure put on them. I feel like strong leadership is really the answer to supporting teachers and making sure that they have a positive experience and that they're willing to stay. I feel like if you're a first year teacher, you should just get like a little get out of jail free card where like if your bulletin boards of data are fucked up, like it's fine. Like you're going through a lot. Like I think you should just get a one year grace period for like your binders and folders and bulletin boards to just be a little fucked up. That survival mechanism of just caring less is so necessary at times because what are you gonna do? Like you can't internalize everything. There's this like drive to martyrdom where it's like, I'm a teacher, I'm here for the kids, like I'm gonna do it all. But you physically can't, you just have to let go of some shit. Then it becomes how much do you let go of? And then when does that make you apathetic to your position and the kids? Where do you draw the line? And for us, that's something that I coach teachers around too is learning how to let stuff go. The ones that are the strongest and most resilient are the ones that know how to bucket their priorities and let stuff go. But now you're just part of the system and you're just letting things go that you came in to change. Mr. Rat, I needed you my first year teaching at 11 p.m. when I was laminating pictures of World War One weapons. Oh my god. <laughs> just let it go. Just let it go. I feel like that's right up your alley. You're probably enjoying that redacted. That was a hobby of yours. No laminating <laughs> is enjoyable when you're sleep deprived. Laminating joy can only come when you're coming to the laminator in a place of abundance. I actually liked laminating. It's fun when you want to do it, but when it's sheet 27 of the World War One flamethrower, it starts to get to you a little bit. See, now, was that something that you needed to do? Was that, that was high priority? It was not. <laughs> they would have been fine if they were not laminated, and the little papers would have gotten fucked up, and it would have been fine, because you didn't use them next year anyway, because coronavirus happened. You did not need to do that. The way my classroom was completely set up for the COVID year. And then my administration told me, oh no, 
you're actually going to be virtual. And I was like, okay, that probably would have been a good thing to know before I decorated my whole classroom. You're going to love it in there. They were like, it's going to be such a good environment for you and <laughs> you alone. Did you have to teach from school? Yes, I did. And that was like, <laughs> no. yes. Fraz, Florida. I literally came in every morning and helped with arrival of students and helped with dismissal for kids that were not my kids that I was teaching at all because yeah. they're all online. And I sat in my classroom that was completely empty and fully decorated to teach my 33 kids online. That is crazy pants. I looked into a virtual teaching position in Florida and found out you have to go into the office every day and do it from a cubicle. So just as like a bar of our sanity around here, there's no children in that building. It is an exclusively virtual school. But I remember same year, the COVID year, where they were telling us nothing in Florida. They were like, the kids are coming. Who knows when or where? I was had in-person kids and they gave me the rules for how far apart the desk were supposed to be. And it was like three tiles because our tiles were exactly a foot. And then they told me, they were like, we did the math and all the desks will fit in your room. And then I, they didn't. I had a freaking yardstick and I'm like crying, trying to get my desks three feet apart I too originally thought it was six and they were like no it's it's different they were like (laughs) once you enter this government building 30 percent of the coronavirus disappears so when you carry the one you only need the three feet yeah I have to go back really quick to the teaching from home in the classroom thing. My former district, there was one school last year that was a literally empty building that they turned into a virtual school site. So there were no students, but every single teacher had to come to the facility to teach every day. And they sat them two in a classroom on opposite ends. It's giving cellmate. But there were no kids. What was the point? They did that to me too. Sometimes I'd be teaching a class and they'd be like, oh, the specials teacher is also going to teach in your class with no kids. And so they'd be yelling on one end of the room and I'd be on the other end of the room. It was mayhem. What a time that was. What a fever dream. It really was. Well, that's like an example of setting a policy just for the sake of control and not actually for the sake of what's best for kids. Or anyone. Right. It's like if only we each had our own places where we go every night and have all of our belongings and a strong Wi-Fi signal. It is absolutely insane this of the policies that were made during virtual learning and it's like we had such an opportunity to correct so many issues in the education system and we totally fumbled the ball couldn't have been worse i remember i was getting observed by the district and this is when i was teaching hybrid so my classes were like pretty 50 50 so i'd have like 10 kids in person and like 10 to 15 online i would use my like work computer for the slides and do like a nearpod and then i would zoom the online kids on my personal laptop from my desk and then just give them the Nearpod code so I didn't have to deal with like screen sharing and then I would just sit at my desk and I could kind of talk to everybody. My admin was so adamant that my Zoom screen needed to be on the projector for my observation. And I was like, so you would like me to on the day of an observation change all of the devices and ways we do everything and then also project the homes of 15 children onto a large board in front of people they've never met without their consent from a computer that does not have a mic or a camera so they will not be able to see or hear us and we got in a 30 minute argument over it because they were so adamant that that is what needed to happen and i was like if they're mad call me into the post observation meeting so silly we got silly in the pandemic in the education system we could have gotten productive but we just got silly productive i still can't believe that you taught hybrid this might just be a trauma response but i loved teaching hybrid i felt like it just scratched a part of my adhd brain that i was like living for so like the way I would do it so one my district was like here are our softwares and I was like that's fucking disgusting I'll be choosing my own fight me thanks (laughs) so I made all the children sign up for Google Classroom and they were like, but it doesn't work with our school email. And I was like, make an email address. You're going to be an adult. First lesson is how to make an email. That's your name and professional. And then I forced them all to sign up for Google Classroom because it's better and you can do it on a phone. And everyone at the district was like, why does Mr. Dacted have the highest scores? And I was like, because I'm the only fucking teacher who made work accessible on a cell phone. Mm. Like, literally, that's the whole reason. That being said, a lot of children did fail because they did not show up to one single thing ever. But 
but I feel like that's kind of above me. Meanwhile, I was trying to teach kindergartners and their parents and their grandparents how to use a Chromebook that was half broken. How is that being 100% virtual with fourth graders? By that point, they've been doing like iReady or something like that for a minute. They've taken a standardized test online. So I feel like they could get with it as opposed to, I remember I was feeling sorry for myself in early COVID days. And I saw a TikTok of a teacher who was trying to explain the difference between mute and unmute and was like holding up cards to the camera. And I was like, oh, I could have it so much worse. Like, I'm mad that they don't know how to format a Google Doc. I could have it so much worse. Having the control of the mute and unmute button for kindergarten was like a freaking dream. They're very cute, but very, very chatty. One thing that I'm curious, is there something that you feel like is like a roadblock for a lot of the people that you work with? I think the most difficult thing for most of my teachers is classroom management. Like knowing how to engage students, number one, and when engagement doesn't go as you would like, being able to redirect students. A lot of teachers that I coach are like really apprehensive about adopting like incentive systems. There's these ideas that like we're not supposed to incentivize kids with like extrinsic motivation. Like they're not like Pavlov's dogs. Like we can't incentivize them that way. But kids actually need some type of extrinsic motivation because not all kids are intrinsically motivated. Some of my teachers kind of like push back on that and they've seen it not work. But then I think part of it is school-wide issues and like part of it is systemic. A lot of schools don't really have like a school-wide behavior plan. That's one of the questions that I ask in an interview is like, what's your school's behavior plan? Not only will it tell you if the school has something like that in place, which is very important, but it might also tell you things that you could be forced to do. They might tell you like, we use clip charts, we use tickets. That is something that you need to know because you're going to be evaluated based on how you engage with their plan and if you're going to push back against it like that's something you should know before you step in the first PD. Mm -hmm. That extrinsic intrinsic motivation thing is something that I struggle with a lot but I am not intrinsically motivated to do shit that I do not want to do. I have ADHD. I am allergic to things that I don't want to do. You need a little treat. I love money. I love food. I love time to (laughs) play my little games and do my little goblin things. I need that. So I get that kids also need that on some level. I think kids really crave it. Yeah, developmentally. One thing like that I would always try and remind myself when I was getting frustrated when I didn't have like the buy-in from kids that I felt like I was entitled to or deserved from them is that like they literally didn't choose to come here. Like they didn't have the autonomy to decide to not come to this building today. And like how would I feel? And I think about how I felt when I was in that situation. And I used a raffle system in my classroom where I would give them raffle tickets for like literally doing anything that I encouraged it really got out of hand at one point with the amount that I was giving out and then I would pull like three to five winners like twice a month where they would get just like a rice crispy treat or like a get out of an assignment pass or something like that and the number of kids that loved it and asked me to ask the principal if we could do it for the whole school and they were like it would be so much more fun if we could get raffle like for being good at lunch or if we could get a ticket in the hallway so even kids that are like on the much older side of the education system I think it's just so natural for it to make them have that buy-in to want to be there and like it might be creating this kind of dependency on extrinsic motivation but like if my boss didn't pay me I would not go to that building every day I do think that you can't rely too heavily on it totally valid like you can't just dangle a carrot all day and not build that relationship or not build collaboration between your students it does have to be I think a multi-tiered system which once you figure out what works for you it gets so much easier to play with it and change it my behavior plan changes usually at least two times a year the kids get tired of it but I love an extrinsic motivator especially in the beginning of the year when they don't know you oh just bribe them you can taper off later you should my favorite moment of the year every time is when I would always do it the same way because like teaching is stand-up to me especially because I taught high school so I'd do the same set three to four times in a row so like I had that down where on the first day of school right before I introduced raffle side note could not reach the speaker for my projector and I didn't have a remote for it on the first day I would always be like can someone turn on the speaker for me real quick and then they would do it and I'd give them a raffle ticket and they'd be like why did you just give me this and then I'd be like let's talk about raffle and it would play a little song you played a song I played like just like generic game show music and I was like in my class we do raffle and like they would be 
lit. And seeing them all be like, oh, raffle, I was like, hell yeah. Well, obviously I didn't say that, but. God, every time you talk about your class, I just want to be in it more and more. Mr. Rat, do you have any advice for our aspirational young teachers? What do you What do you want to say to them? Or aspirational old teachers. If you're 80 and you're like, let me get in that fucking classroom. Power to you. You're going to do great. And Mr. Rat's going to tell you how. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> if I'm 80, I feel like the last thing I want to do is like chase little kids around. So the first piece of advice is if you're 80, maybe don't. Maybe don't. Maybe just enjoy. <laughs> what is my biggest piece of advice? Honestly, I would start with know when to let shit go. Really think about what is going to have the biggest impact on kids and do that first. Then you can start tackling those other little things that you need to get done. I also encourage a lot of my teachers to like bucket their priorities into like what I call crystal balls and rubber balls. Crystal balls are things that if you drop them, they're going to shatter. You're not going to have another opportunity to do them. It's done. It's over. Rubber balls are balls that if you drop them, they're going to bounce right back up. So what are your crystal balls that you absolutely cannot drop? And then what are your rubber balls that if you drop them, it's going to be okay? I love that. Did you come up with that? I didn't, but I would love to claim that I did. Bucketing my balls. <laughs> That's so dirty. <laughs> Well, now that you say it like that. <laughs> if you do that in a lesson, you should give the children like a crystal ball to throw on the ground. I think it would be really good and like really leave like a lasting impact on them. Oh girl, it would leave a lasting impact, honey. I love shards of broken glass in my classroom. What other advice do you have for our new teachers? Because you fucking crush that shit with crystal ball rubber ball. So I want to hear what else you got going on up there. Build strong relationships at your school. It is so important. You can start with like a veteran teacher. If they don't introduce themselves, you need to introduce yourself. Go in their room while everyone's setting it up. Ask them a million questions. If they don't want to respond and they don't want to give you answers, go to someone else. You will find like the veteran teachers in your school that like want to help you out. Latch onto them and learn as much as you can. Then you also need to form strong relationships if you can with your admin and with people who hold decision making power at your school. When I was teaching, like I feel like I had a really challenging relationship with my principal. I feel like she didn't really vibe with me. I didn't vibe with her. So there's just like a mutual understanding like, hey, we're just not going to get along. When we had our data chat, like midway through the year, I feel like I was able to turn that relationship around for the better because we found common ground. We both were really passionate about my student data and getting that to where it needed to be. And so I cared about my scores, period. I know they say like, oh, you're not supposed to care about testing, but like, I'm sorry, like test scores open opportunities for kids. So like we can knock it, but we also need to do our kids like a service by like getting them ready for those tests. You just brought up my favorite hill to die on about student data and test scores. This is gonna get me canceled. I don't care. I feel like it's such an easy cop out for a lot of people to be like, I don't care about test scores. Test scores don't matter to me. That's not why I'm in the classroom. Great. That's not why any of us are in the classroom. That's the world our kids live in. I'm sorry, and I'm going to help you pass it. Because do you know how many children who have come back to me when they were in college and said, you were the first teacher that forced me to try on tests, that did not let me do extra credit, that did not let me bring my grade up in other ways. And I think it's sad that that's the world we live in, but I'm not going to create this little fake fantasy land of my classroom where I don't check into that reality, thus failing you by preparing you for a world that is not real. You're going to be held to these expectations. I wish you weren't, but I'm going to make sure you do really well. And I'm going to make sure you're like well equipped to handle them. We can as teachers fight against that and like advocate for change in that area. And that's wonderful. But we can't just hang our kids out to dry. Like our fourth graders, they're scores on the state test determine if they can take honors classes in middle school. Yep. My first year, I feel like I was scared to push my kids too hard because I was afraid that they wouldn't like me. And I was afraid that their parents wouldn't like me. End of the year rolls around. They said, thank you. You know, we loved having you as a teacher, blah, blah, blah. I might have gotten like a gift or two. After my second year in the classroom, when a lot of people wanted to take their foot off the gas during the pandemic, I floored it because I said, my kids deserve 
a top-notch education. So like, we're going to make something out of it. We can't have like another year, quote, lost. After that year of us being like balls to the wall, like making sure like kids were learning as much as they could, parents were like way more enthusiastic. And my kids like loved me way more because they saw how hard I was pushing them. And at the, at the end of that year, I feel like I got so many gifts and I got so much appreciation. If you think that you're like being too harsh or too strict, you're probably not. Your kids and their parents parents are going to respect you more for holding them to high standards than just dropping the bar down low. Don't be mean, but hold your kids to high standards. One of the things that we always talked about was the warm demander being the best type of management that you can have because it is important that you are empathetic and you're making trauma informed choices and you're not just being a drill sergeant. If you hold kids to high standards, they will meet them and it takes scaffolding and it takes differentiation and it takes work. There's actually a lot of research that shows that the number one predictor of student success is a teacher that believes in them and holds them to high expectations. Yeah and how many of us have had the favorite teacher who pushed us and believed in us and instilled this confidence and skill to reach our own goals. Those are the teachers that people look back on and are like that person changed my life. Not necessarily the person that was your best friend and you had the best time in their class. If anything you look back on some high school teachers and you're like did you not have your own friends like why were you telling us that stuff I know (laughs) such inappropriate things sometimes I'm like now as a teacher myself I'm like I cannot imagine sharing those things or saying those things but when I was a teenager myself I was like this person's so wacky tell us more (laughs) give me the tea 40 year old man like oh my gosh I feel like a lot of people come into teaching with good intentions and teaching attracts a lot of very very like empathetic types of people. And so we come in like wanting to care for students and like wanting to give them that love, that empathy. And I feel like sometimes that causes us to lower the bar for them, especially in some of the schools that I work in that are high poverty schools, knowing the circumstances of your students, that causes a lot of new teachers to drop the bar because they think, oh, they have it so hard. Let me just like be a source of comfort and support. I think it takes teachers a little bit longer to really realize sometimes that actually giving them the support is like holding high academic expectations. Yes, we call that deficit mindset. It's in a way very derogatory to do that. And so many teachers don't realize that that's really problematic. Totally. But you know the people like that come in and are like, I'm going to save these kids. A and- privileged teacher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One thing to say on the pitying of children and then lowering your expectations because of your own bias about an experience you maybe haven't had is... In a common planning I was in, there was a big argument between two people and a veteran teacher who literally molded me into the woman I am today. He said, yeah, they are tired from work. Yeah, they do have a lot on their plate and I still want them to get their high school degree and I still need to teach them these things because at the end of the day, that situation's not going to change in a week, a month, a year, and the world is still going to be the same. As much as you might enjoy it to put your head down on your desk the whole time because a teacher was saying, oh, I always just let him sleep. I feel so bad. He's tired from work from the night before and like that is terrible that's terrible that that is the world we live in I still really want you to learn this so that you can leave this school and go on to achieve the goals that you have for yourself yeah Mr. Rat do you think you'll ever go back to the classroom (sighs) I don't, I don't know what my answer is today because every day I wake up, it's a different answer. Like a lot of my friends will make fun of me because I still have like a lot of my classroom stuff like in bins at my apartment. Oh yeah, that entire closet is full of shit. My entire garage. Like I have so much shit. Like I feel like there's part of me that's like still holding on and like still wants to go back one day. But just like financially and just like realistically in terms of getting recertified because like I'm out of that range now, I'd have to like pretty much start over. I it goes back and forth right now the answer is no tomorrow it could be yes um ask me again tomorrow if i gave you a hundred thousand dollars a year just for being yourself would you go back to teaching? Am I still making my teaching salary? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because so then I'm making what, like 155? Would you not? That's not enough money in Southern California to pay my mortgage. Yeah, that's so. true. In Southern California, that's like maybe one trip to what's y'all's fucking expensive grocery store? Air who? Air One. <laughs> Air One. That's one smoothie from Air One. Air One came on the scene when I was in college at Pepperdine and I was 
perplexed because everything there is disgusting. It's not good. It tastes like dirt. I don't like it. You went to the Zoe 101 school. She I did. did. I want the pear phone. Me too, honestly. A fucking iPhone. Let me get that pear. This was a great episode. I feel like this episode is a teacher training PD. You actually go ahead and log into your portal, everyone, because you actually got <laughs> credit for this. Leave your smart goal Smarty in the goal comments. Smart eagle redacted. Smart eagle. Leave. Right. Do not cancel me. I am so sorry. I only have to make one smarty goal. Leave your smarty goal in the comment section. And then we will send you an email CCing your principal and superintendent to let them know if we feel you deserve credit for the hour of your life that you just wasted. We love you. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Rat. Thanks for having me. I feel bad calling you Mr. Rat. It's okay. It can be endearing. Rats are a very necessary part of our ecosystem, just like ants. Exactly. I love rats. Shit. Let's went off the rails again. Bye, everyone. Love you. Bye. We love you. Bye.